Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги, добрый день, уважаемые гости фестиваля, которые слушают нас сейчас онлайн по всей стране. Я хотела вас поприветствовать. Доброе субботнее утро. И начать лектории Российского химического общества имени Менделеева, который называется «Как настоящие химики создают физику будущего». Почему мы его так назвали, я расскажу чуть-чуть позже. А сначала Сначала я хотел сказать буквально пару слов о Российском химическом обществе имени Дмитрия Ивановича Менделеева. Это одно из старейших научных обществ нашей страны. Оно было создано самим Дмитрием Ивановичем 152 года назад. И вот в прошлом году это общество со всем миром отмечало такой праздник большой, который назывался Международный год периодической таблицы химической элемента. Посвящен этот год был 150-летию открытие Дмитрия Ивановича Менделеевым такого замечательного закона, очень важного и универсального закона для всех наук, как периодический закон химических элементов. Мы его знаем как периодический закон Менделеева. И действительно, весь мир отмечал это событие очень широко. Во всем мире говорили о Менделееве, о российской науке. И э, очень много команд э, приняло участие в том, чтобы этот праздник состоялся. И главной командой в России э, была команда фестиваля науки, э, которую я хочу поздравить с юбилеем, которому в этом году 15 лет, и который является действительно э, самой такой, я бы сказала, профессиональной и э, классной организацией на территории Российской Федерации, которая говорит э, о науке, говорит о науке красиво, говорит говорит о науке правильно и э, заставляет весь мир э, наш, начиная от самых маленьких до самых взрослых наших граждан, э, узнать о том, что наука это интересно, важно и замечательно. И сегодня я бы хотела поздравить э, эту замечательную команду э, с их 15-летием. Я хочу пригласить сюда директора э, фестиваля науки Леонида Гусева и сказать огромное спасибо. Спасибо и огромный поклон за всю ту работу, которая была выполнена в прошлом году и благодаря которой прошлый год стал удивительным и замечательным. Дорогой Леонид Владимирович, можно вас в кадр? Российское химическое общество поздравляет вас с 15-летием Всероссийского фестиваля науки 0+. Фестиваль является крупнейшим ведущим проектом популяризации науки в нашей стране. Благодарим за сотрудничество, желаем успеха в замечательной команде фестиваля науки. Президент Российского химического общества имени Менделеева Аслан Юсупович Цевадзе. Спасибо, Спасибо большое, большое, Леонид. Спасибо, Жалко, Леонид. что сейчас пандемия, я не могу вас обнять и поцеловать, но э, я буду счастлива и в будущем работать с вашей командой, потому что это здорово и замечательно. Спасибо, Спасибо большое, мы большое. очень рады, это работа всей команды. Спасибо. Спасибо большое. Да. Спасибо. Вот вы видите на слайде эту замечательную команду, которая в прошлом году путешествовала э, по миру и рассказывала о науке не только в России, но и во всем мире. И э, в прошлом году фестиваль был посвящен, э, в прошлом году фестиваль был посвящен э, безусловно периодической таблице, а в этом году фестиваль называется, э, называется «Физика будущего». Фестиваль также посвящен а, юбилею а, атомной промышленности, которая исполняется 75 лет. И, э, как я уже сказала, так как мы работаем с фестивалем э, очень тесно и всегда очень рады э, этой работе, э, мы решили сделать э, такую, э, мы решили сделать лекторий, который мы назвали как э, «Настоящие химики создают э, физику будущего». Почему мы так назвали? Что значит настоящее? Настоящее означает сегодняшнее, и настоящее означает настоящее, да? те, которые умеют делать эту химию замечательно. И вы сегодня увидите в течение всего дня доклады удивительных, талантливейших молодых ученых, которые расскажут вам о разных направлениях. А я, прежде чем рассказать, 
рассказать о том, как это будет. Сейчас мне, возможно, да, покажет еще раз презентацию мою. Можно? Да? Значит, я, во-первых, хотел сказать, что этот лекторий проводится, организован совместно с крупнейшими институтами химическими Академии наук. Это такие институты, как Институт общей неорганической химии имени Курнакова, Институт физической химии, электрохимии имени Фромкина, Институт нефтехимического синтеза имени Топчева. Ну и, конечно же, в таком, в таком лектории не смогли мы не пригласить наших коллег из МГУ, химического факультета и факультета наук о материалах. А почему э, мы назвали наш э, лекторий именно так? Я покажу буквально один пример для того, чтобы вы поняли, что действительно э, э, физика будущего невозможна без химии и химических материалов. Показать я это хочу вам на, э, такой, э, на таком примере, как э, создание энергии будущего. Вот вы видите, на этом слайде приведено 10 основных проблем человечества на ближайшие 50 лет. И как это ни странно, несмотря на то, что мы сейчас Сейчас видим, что одна из главных э, э, причин э, сегодняшнего дня и сегодняшних проблем – это болезни, но тем не менее, э, э, тем не менее на первое место все-таки ставится э, вопрос энергии, новых видов энергии. Почему? Потому что, расте... Потому что население планеты очень сильно растет, и за последние годы оно увеличивается очень сильно, и потребности в энергии увеличиваются очень сильно. Мы с вами, в общем-то, уже не очень можем жить без всех тех гаджетов, к которым мы э, привыкли. Мы не можем жить без освещения. И, как вы видите, вот на этом слайде показано, что к 2050 году, по сравнению с 2006 годом, население планеты может увеличиться практически вдвое. И, конечно, вопрос получения новой энергии стоит очень остро. И в этом плане уже сейчас всевозможные альтернативные источники находятся. И, конечно же, в первую очередь это энергия солнца. Вот я показываю вам слайд. В прошлые выходные фестиваль науки проводил свои мероприятия в Сириусе, в Сочи. И мы с коллегами, с группой профессоров выезжали из Сочи. Вы там можете посмотреть на сайте Сириуса наши лекции, которые, которые мы там читали. И вот утро поселившись в гостиницу утром я выглянула из окна я хотела спросить а мою презентацию видно не видно коллеги к сожалению не видно то о чем я рассказываю но значит сейчас я попрошу кого-нибудь коллеги я пока поговорю а вы попробуйте сделать так чтобы мою презентацию было видно моей презентации не видно говорят коллеги видно меня а презентации не видно видно Значит, вот мы поселились в гостиницу, и утром, когда я выглянула из окна, я увидела, ну, в первую очередь, конечно, стадион Фиш, увидела достопримечательности солнечного и прекрасного Сочи, и смотрю, а у меня перед глазами какие-то странные панели. Когда я повернула глаза направо, то я увидела, что эти панели – это солнечные батареи, и вот уже сегодня... Сегодня та гостиница, в которой я жила, она э, питается от солнечных батарей. И это э, замечательно, это уже физика сегодняшнего дня, но э, куда двигаться дальше? Почему нужно что-то еще делать? Потому что те батареи, которые сейчас производятся солнечные, они в основном устроены, э, основным элементом их является кремний, который э, особо чистый, определенный кристаллической модификации и вот этот кремний получить достаточно дорого и поэтому с одной стороны с другой стороны они имеют некий температурный диапазон ограниченный с третьей они в общем то достаточно такие жесткие для того чтобы для того чтобы создать батареи которые будут работать в широком температурном интервале которые будут более дешевы в своем 
своем производстве, которые можно сделать гибкими. Химики органики создают а, а, новые типы органических батарей, а, либо гибридные а, а, органические солнечные батареи, либо а, чисто органические. Появилась ли моя презентация, видит ли, да? И вот я вам хочу привести пример того, как работает гибридная солнечная батарея, так называемая ячейка Грецеля, когда у вас есть некий краситель который поглощает солнечную энергию. Дальше э, эта энергия пере, пере, переходит на э, полупроводник, который в дальнейшем переносит энергию, зажигается лампочка, возвращается на другой электрод, э, энергия рекомбинируется, и вот таким образом циклически э, мы э, солнечную энергию превращаем в электрическую. Для того, чтобы такая схема работала, э, химикам нужно сделать очень очень многое. Химикам нужно подобрать соответствующий краситель, который будет поглощать достаточно широко солнечный свет. Химикам нужно сделать правильный э, материал для электрода, в данном случае это титану-2, который эффективно будет э, эту энергию переносить на себя. Дальше нужно сделать некую среду, в которой, в которой эти электроны могут тоже хорошо переноситься. И вот то, насколько химики сделают правильно каждую из этих стадий будет зависеть, какой в итоге КПД э, данной солнечной э, батареи э, получится. А в целом, да, конечно, это физический процесс, потому что мы фактически превращаем солнечную энергию в электрическую с помощью неких э, фотофизических реакций. И вот, например, э, в нашей лаборатории э, молодые мои коллеги синтезируют э, такие вещества, которые могут очень хорошо и широко поглощать свет. Как вы видите, я вам не буду рассказывать об этих веществах подробно, потому что в нашем лектории будет лекция молодого доктора наук Александра Мартынова, который вам об этом будет рассказывать достаточно подробно, и я думаю, что очень интересно. Но я хочу вам просто привести пример, что эта химия, видите, она цветная, она очень красивая. А, ну, для нас она красивая, а для э, тех устройств, в которых она в дальнейшем будет применяться, она полезная, потому что вы помните, да, что такое радуга, там каждый охотник желает знать, где сидит фазан. Чем больше, грубо говоря, цветов, чем в вашем веществе, чем больше э, ваше вещество может поглотить различного излучения Солнца, тем более эффективно будет э, происходить вот это вот э, преобразование солнечной энергии энергии в электрическую. О солнечных батареях сегодняшнего дня будет сегодня еще одна лекция, и вы услышите, в общем-то, о том, как эта область развивается и куда она двигается. А, ну, а, а надеюсь, что я убедила вас хотя бы на одном этом примере а, а, в том, что, в общем-то, физика будущего невозможна без совместной работы работы физиков с химиками, на самом деле некоторые коллеги мои говорят, ну, замечательно вы придумали название. У вас, говорит, лектория называется «Химики против физиков». Я очень хочу заверить вас, что наш лектория называется, если коротко, «Химики вместе с физиками», потому что современная наука – это такая очень междисциплинарная история, в которой невозможно создать создать реально что-то новое без э, очень такой тесной, э, тесного взаимодействия и сотрудничества между учеными различных направлений. Начнет наш лекторий, наш коллега, замечательный ученый Жан-Пьер Саваш, об этом я расскажу чуть-чуть позже, вот буквально там через пять минут в преддверии его лекции. А пока я хочу сделать небольшой анонс тех лекций, которые вы сегодня, которые вы сегодня услышите. После лекции Жан-Пьера вы услышите лекцию, я уже называла Александра Германовича Мартынова, который вам расскажет о тех самых замечательных 
замечательных соединениях, которые, с одной стороны, могут использоваться в новых технологиях, а с другой стороны, являются полными аналогами природных соединений, природных соединений, которые осуществляют очень эффективные всевозможные процессы в нашей с вами природе. Затем будет лекция физика, которая докажет, что на самом деле химики вместе с физиками, и это будет лекция Андрея Витальевича Наумова, профессора РАН. Вы услышите о том, как пероксид водорода помогает создавать аккумуляторы нового поколения, то, без чего невозможны наши сегодня с вами гаджеты. Мария Александровна Калинина расскажет о гибридных материалах, как монстрах химической вселенной, о солнечной энергетике, о новом типе солнечной энергетики будет рассказывать молодой кандидат наук с факультета наук о материалах Александр Борисович Тарасов. Безусловно, сегодня мы не могли обойти вниманием тему вирусов, потому что это сегодня очень актуальная проблема, поэтому вы услышите доклад «Молекулярные механизмы построения вирусов» от замдиректора Института физической химии и электрохимии Олега Батищева. Александр Шакуров, наш удивительный молодой ученый, тоже из того же самого института, вам расскажет о супрамолекулярной биомиметике, о том, как вдохновляясь природой, химики создают удивительные объекты. Обратный доклад «Физика на службе химии. Современные методы изучения строения соединений» представит Роман Сергеевич Борисов из Института нефтехимического синтеза. Далее будет лекция «Как тут не заржаветь» кандидат наук Душика Владимира Владимировича. Из этого же института будет доклад про ассорционным технологиям для жизни, о создании новых аккумуляторов для, для сорбции газа метана. К сожалению, должна сделать объявление, что лекции Сафонова Алексея не будет, потому что он буквально вчера очень серьезно заболел. Будем очень надеяться, что это не та самая страшная болезнь, которой сейчас болеют миллионы людей в мире. Вот, Алексею пожелаем скорейшего выздоровления. И еще две лекции. Одна лекция будет прочитана Сергеем Шаповаловым из Института общей неорганической химии, которая называется «Химическая связь между атомами металлов, что общего органической и неорганической химии». И завершит наш, завершит наш лекторий профессор Ран Андрей Ширяев, который как раз тоже очень хорошо демонстрирует вот ту связь между физикой и, и химией, потому что он физик по образованию, но при этом он а, доктор химических наук. Его лекция будет посвящена алмазам, путешествия от взрыва сверхновых до нижней мантии Земли. И завершить, прежде чем я вот перехожу, перейду сейчас к лекции Саважа, я хотел сказать одну фразу Марии Кюри, которая говорила, что ничего в жизни не следует опасаться, это только вопрос понимания. Для того, чтобы мы могли не опасаться, нам нужно больше понимать. Я надеюсь, что сегодняшний лекторий поможет вам понять больше о химии, о физике, о современных технологиях. Я надеюсь, что вы заинтересуетесь, если вы, если вы юные наши зрители, которые еще не пришли, не выбрали свою профессию, я надеюсь, что вы, вы выберете в качестве профессии науку, одну из наук, о которых мы сегодня будем говорить, это безусловно и химия, и, и физика, и биология. И вот сейчас через три минуты начнется лекция Жан-Пьера Саважа, Лауреата Нобелевской премии по химии 2016 года, она будет называться «Машины и двигатели от биологии к химии». И Жан-Пьер Саваш, очень большой наш друг, он является иностранным членом Российской Академии Наук. На этой фотографии вы видите момент, когда президент Российской Академии Наук Александр Михайлович Сергеев вручает Жан-Пьеру диплом и значок члена Российской 
Российской Академии Наук. И я очень рада, что у нас сегодня есть такая возможность услышать Жан-Пьера, задать ему вопросы. И я надеюсь, что вам это будет очень интересно. Сейчас я буквально на минуту прервусь. Тут вот технически будет какая-то настройка. И, соответственно, мы перейдем к лекции Жан-Пьера. ago I I present in Russian uh, you and uh, your science and I said uh, for for those people who was not listening me uh, before I would like to present uh, our colleague our our big friend uh, and um, and um, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner in 2016 uh, Jean-Pierre Savage Jean -Pierre Pierre is pioneer in the um, development of molecular machines. And Jean-Pierre is uh, so famous and uh, so great that uh, uh, it's not necessary to describe, uh, uh, describe his CV because I think that all people who is watching us uh, now, they know, uh, they know this, uh, uh, this great, uh, great scientist. Uh, by the moment, Jean-Pierre is a professor of uh, Strasbourg, uh, professor emeritus of uh, uh, Strasbourg University university and uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to give uh, him uh, the, um, now the possibility to give the lecture to the festival uh, uh, of science russian festival of science uh, jean pierre maybe you know that this is anniversary of festival this is 15th years of the festival in russia and this is the biggest festival all russian uh, science festival and uh, uh, we are um, we like to uh, to say um, good luck for for this uh, great team which uh, doing um, this work uh, perfectly and uh, um, and in very high level and now we start uh, start lecture of Jean Pierre uh, uh, again Jean Pierre thank you very much I'm so glad to see you and I think that uh, you have uh, one hour for lecture and questions and it will be moderator who will give the possibility to you to answer questions after after your lecture very good okay thank you Julia thank you very much so shall I start yeah yeah sure yeah, yeah. Okay, so before I start my scientific lecture, um, I would like to thank the organizers of the, the festival. Um, it is indeed a, a wonderful idea to have uh, so many uh, people, including young people, 
uh, participating in a science festival. It's fantastic. So a big thank you. Yeah. So um, let me introduce myself and let me introduce my group. And especially, I would like to show you that um, um, we started uh, many, many years ago because I founded my group in 1980. And uh, we were, at the time, interested in several fields. And so we worked in the fields of homogeneous catalysis, as shown here, um, electrocatalytic reduction of CO2, and that was very successful. Um, inorganic photochemistry with ruthenium and copper complexes. And later on, uh, we became very interested in artificial photosynthesis. So this is very normal. I think at the beginning, a young group tries to find its way. And, um, and so the people tackle various problems in relatively different fields of uh, research. But we were particularly interested in inorganic photochemistry. And I will explain to you how from inorganic photochemistry we, we moved on and we made catenanes. So there was at the time a very big project related to the photochemical cleavage of water to H2 and O2. And you know that this is, a, of course, a very attractive reaction because it would allow you to make dihydrogen, the ideal fuel, from water and solar energy. But there was a, a small problem, let's say. Uh, the reaction is very, very difficult. And the hero of the time was ruthenium trees by pyridine, which is drawn on the slide beautiful complex, an octahedral complex, which is deeply colored. It's a deep red, purple complex. And these molecules have been used by hundreds, probably thousands of researchers because of its very um, interesting properties. Its excited state is able to transfer electrons or a positive charge or transfer energy uh, to another chemical partner, a quencher. But ruthenium is a noble metal, as you know, and um, it is, of course, very expensive. And thus, to many people, it appeared that it would be um, very interesting to replace ruthenium for a much cheaper metal, and in particular, there was a team in the US led by David Macmillan, um, which started to work on copper complexes. And copper complexes uh, leading to photochemical property. And so uh, I will show you now what cationes and rotaxanes are. But keep in mind that copper uh, complexes were very promising in relation to uh, photochemical properties and water splitting. So let's talk about cationates. Cationates are molecular systems consisting of interlocking rays. And in particular, a two cationate, which is shown here, contains two interlocking rays. Rotaxanes are somewhat similar. Uh, they also contain rings, but threaded by um, a molecular axis, and chemists have been interested in cationanes for more than a century. I think the first uh, uh, written discussions on cationanes date back to 1915 uh, in uh, Switzerland. But the synthesis of these molecules seemed to be exceedingly difficult, and this difficulty had an effect it discouraged the chemical community from working on these molecules. So something had to be done. I come back now to copper and to the work of David Macmillan. 
And David Macmillan spent a, a year in Strasbourg uh, at the beginning of the 80s. And of course, we were uh, both interested in inorganic photochemistry, and we had a lot of interaction. And we had made a molecule at the time, a very simple molecule, which is this one here, uh, for other purposes, for catalysis. And when David Macmillan saw the molecule, he became very excited. And uh, he said, well, we must collaborate, uh, because I guess that if we make the copper complex of this molecule, which is represented here, two such ligands around copper, uh, the molecule obtained should have very interesting photochemical properties. And it did. Uh, it turned to be the case. But there was something else. And now let's focus on the something else. If you look at the points, which are in blue here, at the ends of this ligand here, and the two other points in red, in red at the ends of the other ligand. So this ligand is in a vertical plane, the other in a horizontal plane. You can easily uh, imagine that, that by connecting the, the blue points and separately by connecting the red points, you make a catenate. The two rings you would obtain, and this is for the moment still hypothetical, would be interlocking with one another. So we got very excited by this idea and we decided to switch completely um, our field of research and to move towards catenates. And that was facilitated by the fact that a very good friend of mine, Christian Dietrich Buschecker, a great organic chemist, decided to join my young group, and we started together the project. And within one year, we published our first paper on catenates. It was published in Tetrahedron Letters, and it was published in French, just to show that there are other languages than English. So this is a video, which hopefully uh, will show you the, the principle. We start from the, this ligand, which is shown in the corner. We mix with copper. We obtain the entwined system. And now we make a ring on the right, a ring on the left, and we have our catalyst. So hopefully, I think everybody can understand the strategy, which is very, very simple. We also used another strategy, uh, which is based on the, the making of a ring first, and the ring is represented here. You see the two nitrogen atoms of the, the chelating group, the phenanthroline, here. And we will proceed to the threading reaction of another ligand. And finally, by the cyclization reaction leading to the catenane. The same catenane, but in this case, we have only one cyclization reaction. So that was the beginning. We were, of course, very, very happy that it worked. Um, and uh, we embarked in this field of, uh, the people say, chemical topology and catenanes. So we could crystallize the catenane uh, the copper complex catenane, and uh, we could demethylate it using potassium cyanide to generate the metal-free species, uh, the free catenane. And we could obtain X-ray structures, which are shown here. So the copper complex shows a very compact structure with a lot of pi-pi stacking interactions and the metal free species shows a totally different structure, which is very open and very flexible. And the ring, in this case, one ring can glide within the other ring freely. So it was the beginning of uh, molecular machines, not, uh, not as yet molecular machines, uh, but we could show that a very large amplitude motion can be driven by a very simple chemical signal. So we improved the strategy also very significantly uh, by uh, collaborating with Bob Grubbs, 
um, a fantastic uh, chemist, and uh, two postdocs, Marcus Weck and Bernard Moore, two German postdocs, one in, in uh, Grubb's uh, group and the other one in our group. And so we used the re-closing uh, metathesis uh, reaction, which had been uh, proposed by Grubbs and uh, his co-workers, and it worked beautifully. So we have here phenanthralines, um, and we mix those phenanthralines, which are bearing two small chains terminated by olefins, we generated this copper complex, which is the entwined complex. And now we cyclize using ruthenium, uh, ruthenium carbene, um, the Grubbs catalyst, the first generation. We obtain the catenane, we can demethylate, we can also hydrogenate the double bonds, and the overall yield is 92%. So certainly very difficult to improve. So it shows that catenase became normal molecules, accessible molecules, and that basically any organic chemistry group uh, can make catenase relatively um, easily. So let me pay homage to the, the other people who worked in this field, uh, especially those at the very beginning. Ed Wasserman, uh, had proposed a statistical approach for making catenase. It was intellectually uh, very exciting, but in terms of experimental uh, data, it was very limited, of course. Um, Gottfried Schill was probably the father of the field. He proposed the directed synthesis of catenase in 1964. Again, intellectually extremely attractive, uh, but it was so difficult that the people never used uh, this strategy. It was a 23-step synthesis for making a simple catenane. As I said, historically very important. Professor Stoddard started in uh, 1989, and they have done beautiful work and extremely uh, exciting uh, uh, molecular machines related to catenanes and hot axanes. Uh, Hunter and Fertley, also in 92, published some very exciting work. Fujita um, published some nice work on palladium nitrogen bonds. Um, and um, they are still publishing um, a great work. And I think from the, let's say, the, the mid-90s, the field developed very rapidly. So let me just mention very briefly uh, that we have been also much interested in more complex topologies at the molecular level. And in particular, uh, we made uh, uh, multi-catenanes, so three catenanes, up to seven catenanes uh, during the 90s. Uh, we were very interested in knotted molecule, and this species here, which is a knotted ring, was a real challenge and it has been uh, made by our group at the end of the 80s, and much uh, work has been done in our group during the 90s. And uh, in a way, it triggers um, a new field because now several groups have done beautiful work on knotted molecules. Now, let's talk about molecular machines. So we have seen uh, uh, topologically exciting molecules, but uh, let's focus on machines. And there are a few statements on this slide, which are, I believe, very important. So when we look at synthetic molecules, and you know there are millions of synthetic molecules, they are, most of them, 99.99% .99 of them, are considered as static objects. Of course, they move at random, they distort, they vibrate, uh, but the motions are completely stochastic. They move, as I said, at random. There is no control over the motion. By contrast, in biology, uh, things are completely different. Control molecular motions are everywhere. They are absolutely essential. 
And in um, uh, biology, we will see rotary motors, linear motors, uh, walkers, uh, systems undergoing contraction and extension, uh, the ribosome is perhaps the most incredible molecular machine. So motor proteins are everywhere. And uh, although this is not really chemistry, uh, let us spend a few minutes on two examples of uh, biological molecular machines. The ATP synthase, which is an absolutely essential machine because it's uh, related to ATP. Uh, and ATP is the fuel of love, as you know. And the second one is kinesin. So let's briefly uh, look at this video, which is uh, very spectacular. It's a video which is based on scientific data. It's not science fiction, because there are X-ray structures which have been uh, um, reported. So the ATP synthase is uh, kind of embedded in the, the bilayer membrane of the mitochondria in the cell. And uh, it functions as a, um, a ATP making uh, factory. So we have ADP and inorganic phosphate which arrive here and they are converted to ATP, the, the novel form of course of the ATP ADP system, the energy rich uh, molecule uh, which um, leave the place. So ATP is um, purple, as you see here, and ADP is yellow. And you have a rotary motor. It's, it's rotated very, very fast. You have a cluster of proteins here with the hollow part, and there is an axis which threads this uh, ensemble of proteins, and the motion, the rotary motion, is driven by proton transport across a membrane. But it rotates very fast, not uh, as uh, shown on the slide. It rotates about at the, the rate of a Formula One engine, so very, very fast. And of course, you know that everything which is living on Earth is based on ATP synthase. And the other video is very spectacular. Maybe some of you have seen it. It's kinesin. And kinesin is a walker. So in the cell, um, kinesin has a function, a mission, which is to carry molecules from one spot to another point, spot, very far away. And so the kinesin enzyme is this species, not a very big enzyme. And at the back of the kinesin, there is a big bag full of molecules, uh, which is an organelle, and this organelle will travel a long distance in the cell. When I say a long distance, it can be one uh, micron, and it travels because it is hooked uh, by the kinesin, and the kinesin walks very, very fast in a way it runs, and can uh, travel uh, one micron uh, within uh, one second or so, extremely fast. So these are probably two essential uh, biological and molecular machines and very spectacular. Now let's come back to chemistry and see uh, what chemists have done in the field of molecular machines. So at first, I would like to say that uh, many chemists are fascinated by molecular biology. And when they look at uh, um, various systems, belonging to the biological world, uh, they are of course admirative of nature, but they are also eager trying to mimic some of the functions of biology. And mimicking the motion uh, was a real challenge at the beginning of the field, and I think to us it has been a motivation. Trying to make molecular systems which can behave in a way which is vaguely reminiscent of biological systems. And so why are cationanes and rotaxanes so exciting in relation to the field of molecular machines? This is the first question we may address. The answer is very easy. If you look at cationanes and rotaxanes, uh, they are ideally um, ideal molecules 
or for making uh, uh, linear motors like uh, here. So we have a linear motor here, a ring gliding from a position on the left and going to the, on the right, sorry, and going to the left and coming back. So very similar to a linear motor. And those two systems are, in a way, close to rotary motors. Uh, maybe an axis can spin within uh, a ring, uh, which it has threaded, or a catenane can spin, or at least oscillate, or pirouette, um, within another ring, which is considered as motionless. So now let me discuss the first molecular machine we built um, in Strasbourg on a two catenate. So this is old work, uh, but in a way for us, it was the beginning of everything. So we start from a catenane. It's a relatively simple catenane, a little bit more complicated than the catenane we have seen before, because at the back here, we have what we call a terpiridine. It's a tridentate fragment with three nitrogen atoms. One, two, three. And copper is here. And copper basically has two oxidation states, copper one and copper two. So we have to know that copper one likes to be coordinated to four nitrogen atoms. Copper one likes to be tetrahedrally coordinated. Copper two is totally different. So if we oxidize copper one to copper two by abstracting an electron from copper one, we generate a species, which is a D9 electronic configuration metal, but this is not so important. But copper two likes to be coordinated to five nitrogen atoms, or even six nitrogen atoms. So what we have done here, abstracting an electron from copper one to generate copper two, destabilizes completely the system. Copper two is terribly unhappy. So the system will react, the ring will glide here, and we will obtain another molecule with a very, very stable copper two. Copper two is now five coordinated, and it is, of course, uh, very happy so to say. So it takes a bit of time, but it is very clean. Now we can go back. Copper 2 can be reduced back to copper 1. And copper 1 will be very frustrated because copper 1 wants to be four coordinated. So the ring will glide again, and you will regenerate the starting form of the molecule. So there are two weak points here. It's not a real rotary motor because we have no control over directionality. It's kind of a pirouetting machine, or oscillating machine. <clears throat> and the second weak point is that it's a very sluggish system. It takes time for the system to move here from one position to the other position. But as we will see in a minute, uh, so we could, we could sort out uh, this problem. I have a video here which uh, I believe is uh, spectacular, which will certainly help you visualize the process. So we start from copper one, we abstract an electron, we generate copper two, the system moves, we can re-inject the electron, the system moves again. Copper one, now which is four coordinate, can be again oxidized to copper two, the system will move, etc. And the beauty of the system is that, of course, I can do that as many times as I like in my computer, but it is exactly the same with the molecules. We can uh, set them in motion uh, as many times as we like. There is no fatigue at all. So the system was very slow to move, as I said at the beginning, and so we improved it. And we spent um, a lot of time, uh, maybe 12 years or even more, uh, for making a fast moving uh, molecular species. And in particular, uh, we made uh, a pirouetting rataxane, 
And this is the fifth generation of molecular machines in our group, which moves in microseconds to milliseconds. So that was a spectacular improvement from the very first uh, uh, swinging or oscillating catenane we had made uh, in the 90s uh, to the, the most um, uh, recent molecules, uh, which moves very, very fast. Let me speak about the work of other contributors, and in particular, um, our uh, good friend, uh, Fraser Stoddart and his group. So a molecular shuttle um, is um, very simple. The principle is very simple. Like the, the shuttle bus going from the airport to the city center, if you still take uh, airplanes, which is not my case, but uh, you have a ring which can glide from a position to another position, go back to the second position, etc. And that was, I think, a spectacular molecular machine uh, proposed by Fraser Stoddart uh, the same year as our uh, oscillating catenane. Uh, it is uh, drawn here on this side, uh, reported in Nature. Uh, so we have what they call the blue box, which is a very strong electron acceptor, you see, full of positive charges. Uh, with very, very strong pi acceptors and also able to participate in hydrogen bonding. Um, and this molecule can move from a green station to a red station and come back to the green station uh, using electrochemistry. But we have no time to discuss the process in detail. Simply, you can keep in mind that this led to very important potential applications related to uh, um, electronic uh, memory storage devices based on molecules, not based on silicon, like uh, all the, the, the devices we are using, which are based on uh, semiconductors, uh, but they were based on molecules. Beautiful work. Let me now pay homage to um, a, a giant uh, of the field, Ben Feringa, uh, who reported the first rotary motors uh, made out of molecules. And so there was a very spectacular publication in 1999 um, in uh, Nature, again, um, reporting the first light-driven rotary motor. Well, by the way, there was another paper published back-to-back uh, -back with Feringa's paper in the same issue of uh, Nature uh, by uh, Ross Kelly and his group. And it was also a rotary motor, but based on chemical reactions. And of course, chemical reactions are much more complex uh, to, let's say, to set a system in motion than law. And so this is the system they had been using, Feringa and his group, based on photochemistry of double bonds. And if you have a sterically hindered double bond, uh, you probably know that when you shine light on it, uh, you do photochemistry uh, using UV light, and you can isomerize the double bond. So starting from this double bond, you generate the excited state, and uh, the system will move and you will generate these species. And now, if you wait for some time, if you heat even, the system will go on and this part here will go on the motion, it will still rotate a bit and you generate, generate the third form of the molecule. And finally, you shine light again, uh, you irradiate using UV light and the system will continue to move you generate the fourth state of the molecule. And now if you heat or if you wait, uh, you go back to the original initial state of the compound. And I know that this part was more or less discovered by accident by the group of Ben Feringer. But it doesn't change anything. It's a, it's a great discovery. It's a real rotary motor. And they also published on the internet a beautiful video um, which I will uh, show you, 
So we have here uh, the double bond here, and it will rotate around the double bond. And you see this signal or this uh, symbol, uh, which means heating, like a heating device. And so we will have four signals, heating, photochemical, it will be a flash of light, heating again, the third signal, and a flash again. So let's start. So we heat. Now we flash. We heat. We flash. We heat. When I say we, this is Ben Feringa's group. It's not my group at all. So this is the system. And I hope you can visualize the rotation. Julia, can you visualize? Yes. Because uh, some yeah, people sure. have difficulty. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, some people have okay. difficulty. Yeah. But I think it's a beautiful video, and I wanted to, you know, to uh, uh, borrow it to a Feringas uh, group. So now let's talk about something different. Uh, we became interested from the beginning of the years uh, 2000 in um, muscles, artificial muscles. And it's nowadays a very active field of research, uh, trying to make artificial muscles with molecules. And um, just to remind you, uh, biological muscles uh, behave in a now very well understood way. They are not like metal springs, you know, which you contract and, and extend. Uh, they are based on filaments, and those filaments can glide along one another. And this is shown here. As I said, it's now very well understood. We have thick filaments, uh, which are based on myosin. And you have thin filaments, which are self-assembled polymers uh, containing actin. And, uh, and these uh, thin filaments, when the muscle contracts, will glide. They will glide towards the center of this system. And this system is a sarcomere. It's the, the elemental unit of the muscles. And now when you contract, of course, uh, those filaments will glide and vice versa. This is an ATP consuming process because you need energy. You know that to contract your muscle, uh, it's tiring and you cannot keep it contracted forever. So at some stage, the muscle will have to relax, and uh, the relaxation process uh, leads you back to your um, elongated muscle. And this is now uh, not consuming ATP. And so our model was um, very simple compared to uh, real muscles, but it was relatively complicated for chemists. So it was a real tour de force to make it, to synthesize it, and um, I would like to thank these two uh, fantastic uh, chemists for um, succeeding and, and they, so they could make this molecule. The system is very complex and I think we have no time to enter the details. So just it's a rotaxane dimer and this rotaxane dimer can be uh, contracted like shown on the slide are elongated again. And the length of the system varies from 8 nanometers in the elongated form to uh, 6 nanometers, roughly, in the contracted form. And so we send chemical signals to the molecule. And um, this um, piece of work initiated some beautiful work by other teams in the world uh, now who are able to, to make um, um, artificial muscles, so to say, uh, using uh, pH changes or um, electron transfer. And I believe in, it could even become important in the future. Now let me finish up with the very last scientific example uh, from our group. Um, it's a more recent work, uh, very ambitious. The idea was trying to make a molecular compressor, a big molecule which can encapsulate small molecules and compress them. Of course, 
very, very ambitious. But um, <coughs> let me explain you the principle. So the, the target was a four rotaxane. A rotaxane containing four uh, non-covalently linked fragments, two dumbbells or two axes, if you like, and two bis microcycles. So each bis microcycle, uh, which is represented in blue, contains a central part here, and this central element is a plate. A plate, a square plate, um, and it will be a porphyrin because porphyrins are very uh, convenient uh, to work with. Well, Yulia, it could also be a phthalocyanin, I'm sure. But if you have a porphyrin and if you are able to insert a guest in between those two porphyrins, uh, you will form a complex. And now the idea was to see whether we can move the plate and contract the guest uh, and modify its shape or even expel it. So uh, the target we had in mind was this molecule. And this is of course very ambitious. And you see the guest can be inserted uh, between the, the two plates. And so we have again the two bis microcycles, uh, two stoppers, here, two other stoppers here, and the dumbbells here and here. And everything relies on copper. Copper will allow you to make the molecule because uh, copper has a templating effect, which is fantastic. It can attract various organic fragments, uh, orient them, keep them in a very well-known uh, geometrical situation, and then favor formation of uh, catenase or protaxanes, and in particular in this ca case, favor the formation of this molecule. So I will skip the synthesis, but you should know that it was a difficult synthesis, but not as difficult as we had imagined at the beginning, because of copper and because of symmetry. So now let me show you the X-ray structure of the compound. It was not expected that we could crystallize the molecule, but it worked out. Um, it was kind of an accident because we wanted to do NMR and the molecule crystallized in the NMR tube, which is not so exceptional. Uh, you can see the, the dumbbell here, uh, the beast macrocycles, and the two porphyrins. And the porphyrins contain zinc atoms, and these zinc atoms we will be able to bind to a weak bases. And so the guests we will incorporate uh, are slightly basic and they are uh, containing pyridine very often or amines. And those guests will be happy to lie in this cavity with a distance of about nine or 10 angstroms between the two zinc ions. And the, the icing on the, on the cake came with the X-ray structure, uh, as I said, and I think it helps visualize uh, the molecule. Uh, as you, you will see, there is space here. Uh, there is a, a, good, you know, a good cage, there is some space. And so we will take advantage of this ability to form a complex. Now let's look at the, the process. And so we have studied the reaction. I mean, in detail, we know everything of this reaction. Now the signal we will send is quite simple. We remove the copper. It's a very fast chemical process. We send um, a, a tiny amount of cyanide and the copper will be immediately uh, kicked out. And when the copper is kicked out, uh, the, the system rearranges completely, it flattens completely. So the copper is removed, and now this fragment will interact with the zinc, this other fragment with the other zinc, and the molecule flattens completely. And you can easily imagine that when it flattens, the guest which was in between the two porphyrins will be compressed and finally kicked out.
So it's kind of a compressor, and uh, we can go back. We introduce copper again, we regenerate uh, the starting form of the molecule, and we can reintroduce a gas here, which will be, again, compressed if we remove copper. So this is uh, summarized on this slide. It's a compressor or a switchable receptor. And we have a guest uh, which is incorporated uh, in between the two plates. So here, it's a compressor, it's a good receptor. And using chemical signal, we can compress and expel a guest from uh, this uh, molecular system. So just uh, a few examples of molecular machines. So we have seen pirouetting catenanes, shuttles. This is the work of uh, Fraser Stoddard and his team. Uh, light driven uh, rotary uh, motors, Ben Feringa and his group. Um, molecular compressors, molecular pumps. So this is some beautiful work by uh, Stoddard, very recent work. Uh, molecules able to walk, uh, on a rail, and there is uh, gorgeous work done by David Lee and his group um, trying to mimic a ribosome. This is also fantastic work uh, by the team of David Lee, an extremely imaginative uh, chemist. Um, Rotax Science uh, with uh, uh, flapping wings this is our work, and many, many other examples of very exciting systems. And I would like to uh, conclude by saying that before the emergence of molecular machines, synthetic molecules, again, were considered as motionless objects. And um, molecular systems undergoing large amplitude motions in a controlled way were scarce. So the work on molecular machines has completely changed the way chemists or even other people and chemists look at molecules. Uh, molecules can indeed behave as molecular machines, molecular motors. And I think this is the main uh, uh, merit of our work. Uh, there are many, many people who contributed to the, the work I reported. Uh, I, in particular, I would like to thank the permanent people in my group, uh, because this is the specialty or the uh, the particularity of the French system, uh, the CNRS and the university, uh, we work as teams of people. So let me come back here, as teams of people. And here we have a list of uh, incredibly uh, good permanent people who worked in my group uh, for many, many years, for some of them, uh, Christian Dietrich, Jean-Claude Chambron, Jean-Paul Collin, uh, Valérie Heitz, Jean-Marc, uh, Cairn, uh, and so their contribution was absolutely essential. Uh, there were many PhD students and postdocs, but I'm afraid we have no time uh, to name them, uh, I'm sorry. Um, so on, on the, in the field of molecular machines too. Uh, the very first system I spoke about, the compressor, uh, this is the work of these people, um, and um, <clears throat> I would like to thank my uh, university, uh, the CNRS, uh, my former uh, mentor, and who is now a very good friend, Jean-Marie Lane, who was kind of a model for me, an uh, unreachable model to me, uh, my um, postdoc uh, supervisor uh, many years ago, Malcolm Green, uh, two teachers, uh, my family, because they were very supportive, and my two good friends, Fraser Stoddart and Ben Feringa. And just uh, before I finish up, I have a few comments, a few remarks uh, for young scientists, mostly, mostly uh, or for our students, who one day, hopefully, uh, will become uh, group leaders and do research. Uh, novelty is very important. Interacting with other scientists is also a key uh, element in your research and your creativity. So be ready to encounter people. 
Try to talk to them. Try to listen to them. Trust young scientists if you are already a well-established scientist. Trust young scientists. They can be very, very creative. And probably the most important, at least to, for my team, jumping from a field which you know very well to another field uh, which is less known to you is absolutely essential and it can be ben very beneficial. Don't hesitate. Don't ask yourself if you, if you are able to do it. Just do it. If you fail, nobody is going to kill you. And another important point is the importance of serendipity. Uh, try to understand surprising observations instead of throwing everything in the sink. You know, try to understand what happened and you can discover very important things. And there are several Nobel Prize winners uh, who made their discovery thanks to serendipity. And finally, a big thank you for your attention. Thank you. I'm finished. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre. Uh, as always, brilliant lecture. And uh, we have some question. The first question was uh, asked by uh, from Sergei Ivashka, but uh, um, you almost answered it, but I will read it. Uh, thank you, Professor, for lecture. We will uh, glad to see you in Moscow State University because uh, Sergei Ivashka is from the chemical department of Moscow State University. Can you say that communication with a large number of colleagues played a crucial role in your discovery? Uh, of course, you, you, you answered this uh, in, in your last questions, but you can comment some uh, thing uh, again. Mm -hmm. On the importance of uh, collaborating. Oh, yeah, and, collaborating uh, with a large number of colleagues is yeah, a key, sure, key parameter sure. of... Uh, yeah, I think we, had, we have an incredible uh, number of groups we collaborated with, including your group. Uh, we were not familiar with talosanins, and thanks to you and to Sasha and Martinez. Sasha, Sasha is also here. You can Sasha see Sasha is also here. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you, Sasha. So we, we learned a bit of uh, fellow signings. And uh, of course, it, that was very important to us. Uh, we collaborated to, with photophysicists and photochemists. And uh, we collaborated with uh, porphyrin experts. And I think without collaborations, we would not have uh, achieved, you know, uh, one-fourth uh, of what we could achieve thanks to the others. So yeah. it's a big thank you. Let me say thank you to all the people and the groups we collaborated with. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, uh, today uh, from your lecture, we start the lectorium, the cycle of the lectures. Uh, uh, and the title of this lectorium is uh, How True Modern Chemists uh, Make the Future of Physics. Because the uh, title of the uh, science festival this year is uh, uh, Future of Physics. And okay. our main goal, uh, yeah, the main goal of uh, our lectorium is to demonstrate that uh, without chemistry, there is no the future of uh, physics, because all materials and all chemistry is the uh, basis of the physics. Can you comment something on this for, for the people? Because, you know, this lecture uh, is translated not only by Zoom, but uh, also in YouTube channel, and uh, there are a lot of people who is... Uh, watching us now and yeah. i think it's very important from your side to to comment on this that um, interdisciplinary of science now is a key parameter of success something like that yeah, yeah? Mm -hmm. no it's clear that uh i mean in, in physics you have of course many areas many fields uh in uh, theoretical physics Chemistry has little importance, but uh, I mean, physics is also concerned with materials and materials uh, and even uh, small molecules. And uh, there is no way, you know, uh, uh, material physics 
can uh, make discoveries uh, without chemistry. I mean, this is the same science, you know. Material science involves uh, physics and chemistry, and they have to work together. No, there is no, yeah, no yeah, possible yeah. discussion. Yeah, because, for example, the rector of the university in the opening ceremony of uh, science festival said that, for example, quantum computer is the future of physics. But we should say that uh, there is, uh, it will be no, uh, it cannot be developed, the quantum computer cannot be developed if chemists will not synthesize and develop appropriate molecules. So that is why we decided to organize Organize such a lectorium to demonstrate uh, how chemists and physics should work together. Yeah, that's uh, a very good uh, idea. This, uh, yeah. And I think Sasha also has a question. I will give him the possibility uh, to do this. Bonjour, Jean Pierre. <laughs> uh, so our question is very, I would say, common for your talk, I think, uh, to say something about future of your developments, how do you see uh, the future of catenanes and rotex aids in uh, yeah. real life? In real life, you mean in terms yes. of applications? I mean, yes, in terms of applications. Uh, um, well, maybe you know, but there is already an application of hotaxanes, polymers mm -hmm. built with hotaxanes. Uh, there is a commercial uh, application, uh, which is to make uh, uh, very adaptable materials. And uh, there, I think there are two companies in Korea and in Japan. They made uh, films of... Uh, um, Rotaxane polymers, and those Rotaxane polymers are very, very flexible uh, because the threads can uh, glide within the rings so that if you protect your screen with such a material, if you have a screen, you cannot scratch it. If you scratch it, it self repairs within a second. I think this is the, the main uh, commercial application. But in terms of molecular machines, of course, one can be more ambitious. And uh, personally, I believe in uh, biological and medicinal applications. Um, having molecular machines, which will have to be biocompatible, I think biocompatibility compatibility will be extremely important. Uh, but biocompatible machines, uh, which can uh, travel in uh, our fluids, in blood, let's say, and uh, maybe kill uh, cancer cells or, uh, or viruses or whatever uh, by delivering drugs close to the, to the cell or to the, the virus or the bacterium. Uh, I think this will be the future. Did I answer your question? Yep. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you, Sasha. So, uh, I would like to say, Jean-Pierre, that Sasha will give talk uh, just after you about about porphyrins and phthalocyanins. And, wow. uh, yeah, and uh, then today we also will uh, will listen to the lecture about uh, modern uh, solar cells, about uh, uh, about how physics, uh, physical methods uh, um, uh, used uh, in chemistry for the uh, for the development of new materials. We also will have lecture of Professor Naumov about uh, uh, single fluorescent molecules. So uh, until the evening, uh, it will be the big lectorium of the young great scientists. Uh, I, will, uh, I would like also say to people who are watching us in YouTube that Jean-Pierre uh, uh, is, um, I would like to say that Jean-Pierre is almost twice Nobel Prize winner because uh, uh, his teacher is Nobel Prize winner Jean-Marie Lien who received his um, uh, Nobel Prize for the synthesis of catenanes and catenanes were... Uh, for, uh, uh, 
yeah. uh, cryptanes, sorry. Uh, yeah. And cryptanes was the main subject of the uh, Jean Pierre PhD work. I'm right. Uh, am I right, Jean Pierre? Yeah, yeah. With my yeah. good friend Bernard Dietrich, yes. Yeah, so. So, so, so uh, this is also a very uh, useful lesson for, for young scientists that uh, uh, if you are working with uh, great teachers, great mentors, you always will receive in future your, your Nobel Prize or your great results, yeah? <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, I, uh, maybe moderator will correct me if we have some more questions for Jean-Pierre. So if not, Jean-Pierre, thank you again very much for brilliant lecture. It was great pleasure to see you and uh, um, I'm and uh, all your Russian friends wish you and Carmen uh, healthy, stay safe. And uh, this is not very, uh, um, this is, um, I would like to say, a special time uh, in the world now and special situation. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, it will be changed and in near future we will see one to another in one, in one place and uh, so um, stay safe and be healthy and uh, you. Uh, see, you, see you in near future it's and my it's best also regards very nice to, to you. And I was also very happy to you. And thank you for all our our people who who were uh, watching you and listening to you. And uh, okay. bye, bye, bye. Bye, 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 thank Julia. You. Thank you. В жизни всегда есть место открытием. Откройте веб галери
Встречай Сбер. Твой банк. А еще Сбер — это целая вселенная. С универсальным доступом. Легко и просто. Выгодная подписка. На все сразу. Салют. Умный ассистент поможет выбрать фильм на вечер, поговорить о жизни. А ты хороша. Спасибо за комплимент, Андрей. А еще доставим, накормим, довезем. Что-то еще? Отправим, сориентируем, поможем бизнесу взлететь. С нами 100 миллионов клиентов. Такое кино, такие новости, такой звук. Сбер. Больше, чем банк. Сбер для жизни. Что снимать в TikTok Live? Да что угодно. Сними, как тебя разбудило солнце. Или как ты разбудил соседей. Сними свой завтрак. Или тех, кто не дает тебе позавтракать. Покажи привычный вид из окна. Или вид, к которому не можешь привыкнуть. Увлекаешься чем-то? Покажи это. Просто снимай. А зрители найдутся. Снимай, если на работе произошло что-то интересное. Или твоя работа — это и есть что-то интересное. Покажи, как пропадаешь дома. Покажи, куда едешь. Или почему пришлось остановиться. Покажи что-то новое. Покажи неизменную классику. Покажи тренировки. И покажи результат. Покажи семью. Покажи друзей. Ведь твоя реальная жизнь — это и есть самый невероятный контент. Покажи, чем ты живешь. Посмотри, чем я живу. ТикТок Лайф. Границы вселенной. Скорость мысли. Невидимые миры. Абсолютный ноль. Все это не просто слова. Это телеканал «Наука». Нам есть чем вас удивить.